Hey, what's up YouTube? Welcome to the third and final video of this series where I show you how I built this neat scan effect in Unreal Engine 5. In the first video, I showed you how to set up inputs, get all the blueprints required for this effect, and set up the material parameter collection as well. In the second video, I went over the actual post-process material and explained how it's built from the ground up. In this third and last video, I'm going to explain how to push that scan effect a tiny step further by adding a 3D grid effect using Niagara. So let's not waste any time and jump right into it, shall we? First things first, I'm going to create an empty Niagara system. Then add a Niagara component to that scan actor and make it use that system I just created. Next, I'm going to toggle that Niagara component's visibility when this blueprint component updates its scan state. So it should be visible when exiting the faded out state and hidden when entering it. Last thing I want to do is to update that Niagara component's location so it follows my pawn around. I'm not going to attach it because I actually want that component to keep its rotation and scale, so I'm just looking to update its location, which is straightforward enough to do. I already get this control pawn's location here, so I might as well use it to set this scan actor's location. So I'm actually going to convert this to a function so I can store this actor's location in a local variable and get it just once. And then update this scan actor's location, but do that using a grid snap node and the cell grid size. The very last step in this first chapter is to create a Niagara parameter collection and link it to this material collection I created in the first episode. This will create an exact duplicate of this material collection and will also update it anytime this material collection is updated, so that's quite handy. This Niagara system is kinda split into two parts. It's used to create grid lines, but it's also used to create those grid points where those lines intersect, right? These little cubes are actually sprites using a material with a ray traced cube function, so it's kinda cool. Let's focus on that for now. First of all, I need to update this system state so that it loops only once. Then, upon spawn, I'm going to set an integer and it's going to be based on a float. The scan range divided by the grid cell size. That's how many cells there are per axis in this 3D grid, right? Then create an empty emitter. Set it to local space, that's extremely important, and GPU. Disable this interpolated spawning option and set its bound to fixed as well. Then add an initialized particle module in the particle spawn stack. And right away set a color and a sprite size. Then I'm also going to add a particle state module in the particle update stack and disable that kit particles option. Next step in the emitter update stack, add a spawn particles in grid module. That's going to throw some errors, but it's fine. Click fix twice to open an emitter state module and a grid location module. Okay? That x, y, and z count are all going to be set using this particle count axis system variable. And this grid location's offset is going to be 0.5, normalized, and XYZ dimensions, this grid cell size float. Next step, I'm going to create a custom module in the scratch pad. Name it get normalized distance, add a particle position, a vector input, and a float input. Now this emitter is in local space because I want particles to move with it. However, here I need to ensure this position is converted to world space. Because I want to get the distance to the scan position, which is the pawn's location, which is known to be a world space location, right? Then divide by that range, maybe check for divide by zero while we are at it, and saturate. That's this particle's normalized distance to the pawn, and that is going to be an output variable because I want to use this value in other modules. Now never forget to actually set those inputs right away. This vector is actually stored as a linear color in that Niagara parameter collection, so I need to convert a linear color to a vector, like so. 
And that range is actually going to be divided by 2 because this range is the entire grid extent. And I want the normalized distance from somewhere around its center to its edge, thus half its range. Alright, let's create a new module called Update Scan Sprite Size. In that module, I'm first going to get the particle sprite size, but its initial one. That's important to avoid a sort of feedback loop. Then multiply with a curve sampled at a given time. And that will allow me to control the particle size based on that normalized distance I just computed, to have particles fade out in the distance. Here I'm just going to allow me to select if I want to scale particles in X or Y or both using static switches. Then multiply that sprite size with yet another curve, and that will allow me to control the particle size over the scan normalized time. Remember that scan components fade in and out time. Sweet, I'm just going to make sure variables are properly grouped. And right away, I'm going to set those parameters and tweak those curves. I want to have this particle scale down in the distance. And have them scaled in with some kind of bounds when that scan effect fades in. Then add a sprite render and assign it a material. Material I already prepared to keep the video somewhat short. That material is translucent and unlit. Fog is also disabled, and translucency pass is set to after depth of field. Important. Depth test is disabled as well. And because the post process material is rendered before translucency, well, that allows me to have colored particles on top of the desaturated scan image. Not only that, but because depth test is disabled, particles show through opaque meshes, and that also allows me to do cool things. So the first thing I do is to get that depth information to see if this translucent pixel is in front or behind opaque meshes. This is done using this simple material function to compare this pixel's planar distance to the camera with a depth buffer. And that lets me know how distant a pixel is to the opaque surface, either in front of it or behind it. Thus, I can build a bevisible statement to create a binary mask, and let's say use a different color when behind surfaces, like so. Next step is to rebuild some kind of pixel occlusion just for the pawn. It's quite simple, get that pawn stencil index, get the stencil buffer and compare it with this index to create a black and white mask. Mask used to make this material fully transparent if behind an opaque surface, so not visible, and that surface happens to be the pawn's mesh. Next, that blink mask is exactly identical to the mask I used in the post-process material, remember? This ensures this particle matter is only visible inside that expanding bubble, if that makes sense. This next effect is also exactly identical to that pulse effect I built in that post-process matter. And it's also similarly used to boost this emissive value. Speaking of that post-process matter, this expansion ring mask is also copied from it, and it's used to even further boost that emissive value. So particles are brighter just for a brief moment when that scan expands. Then I get the particle's color on alpha, nothing fancy. Then I build a spherical gradient, quite basic as well. Next, I have this custom HLSL function that creates a ray traced cube. I'll let you check this link for more information. And all that tied together lets me build this all in all quite simple material. For the emissive value, if that translucent pixel is in front of opaque surfaces, meaning it's visible, then just get the particle's color and boost it by some amount with those two masks. Else, if behind opaque surfaces, just use a different color and a different boost amount. For the opacity, it's even simpler. If visible, use that ray twist box mask. Else, use that simple spherical gradient multiplied by this character mask to occlude pixels that are behind it. It's multiplied by the particle's alpha and further multiplied by that blink mask I mentioned earlier. 
I also scale this sprite size using wall position offset to make it grow a bit based on this pulse value. I probably should do that in the particle system instead, but I was a bit lazy. And that creates this sprite effect. It has the appearance of a 3D cube when not occluded, and a discolored blurred spherical dot when occluded. It's kept quite subtle to not make this can effect look too noisy, because it's quite a lot already, visually, right? And too much is just too much. Next, I'll duplicate this emitter to create grid lines in the x-axis to begin with. It's almost identical. Just need to subtract one to this particle count in the x-axis. Then change the sprite size to non-uniform and make a 2D vector. Its X component is going to be the grid cell size and Y a line thickness of say 12. Next, I'm going to add a sprite facing and alignment module and configure it like so. I'm also going to have these grid lines scale up over time, only in the X axis though. And disable scaling by distance. And then I'm going to add a dynamic material parameters module to send this normalized scan distance to this sprite renderer's material, which is going to be a different material, but more on that in a second. Speaking of which, this sprite renderer must make use of that custom alignment and facing vectors. Last step, copy this emitter two more times, one for the y-axis and one for the z-axis. For both, change this to subtract one to the desired axis. And finally, change this sprite facing alignment module to make particles face the desired axis as well. Alright, this second material is pretty much identical to that first one I just explained. See, this whole section is an exact copy. Just have to make sure this material is two sided. Instead of using a spherical gradient and a ray traced cube, though, I create a vertical bilinear gradient from UVs. And I also create a dotted line mask. To achieve that, I simply multiply the red channel by some amount, use fraction, and repeat this part here, and it gives me a dotted line. I also chose quite arbitrarily to have more dots up close than at a distance, using this normalized distance value sent by Niagara, mainly because I thought it would help to reduce noise a bit. Again, this effect has quite a lot going on already, so I don't want to overdo it. Anyway, that's pretty much it to be honest, emissive is identical. Opacity was slightly modified, but nothing drastic. If behind opaque surfaces, I use that dotted line mask, feather dot by distance, and feather dot vertically as well, to produce a softer line the more distant it is. It helps to reduce aliasing. This is really arbitrary by the way, I was just trying random things and looks to be honest. I pretty much just used a couple of smooth steps on that vertical gradient to control both the thickness and smoothness of those lines, and yeah, I suppose that's it, that's how I created this 3D grid effect. By the way, there are plenty of cool things to try with that translucency see-through trick, the sky is the limit really. Voila, that's the end of this series on this scan effect, I hope you liked it. Feel free to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you did. Files are available as a tier 3 reward on my Patreon. You're more than welcome to join in if you want to support me, see more content like this, and have access to a never growing list of cool UE projects and demos. That's it, I'll take a quick summer break now and be back strong. Thanks to all my patrons for the amazing support, and thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video, take care of yourself, bye bye!